President Trump signed an executive order last week to end his administration's policy of separating families who cross the border into the U.S. illegally. More than 500 children have been reunited with their families, but about 2,000 kids remain separated. The Texas Tribune is now reporting some adults being held in a facility outside Houston are being asked to sign voluntary deportation orders in exchange for being reunited with their kids. One man told the Tribune he abandoned his case for asylum out of desperation. Jay Root is an investigative reporter for the Texas Tribune and the co-author of the story. He joins us now from Austin, Texas. Jay, uh, you described the case of one man who you identified as Carlos, but what do we know if the practice of asking detainees to sign deportation orders is common and if people are choosing to do so? <clears throat> Well, we really don't know. You know, the, the incoherence out of Washington is sort of duplicated on the ground in these facilities. Um, when I talked to Carlos, I, I met him in this facility that's a, a male-only facility in Livingston, Texas, which is about 75 miles outside of Houston. And he told me that on June 21st, which was Thursday, that everything all kind of happened at one time. He was told that he did not pass his credible fear exam and keep in mind that about half of, there's a study out that shows that half of the people who fail their credible fear exam can get it reversed if they have attorneys um, by an immigration judge. But anyway, he was told on Thursday he did not pass his credible fear exam. Then he was told if he signed a voluntary uh, departure order, that it, which he did sign, that he would be reunited with his daughter at the airport. Um, an immigration attorney talked to another man who gave an almost identical scenario at the same facility. Carlos told me that about 20 to 25 men had been separated from their kids and, and were in this facility. And he said the majority of them were told the same thing. So, and then I just talked to Ann Chandler of the uh, Tahere Center before I came on the air. Um, she, it was her group and her pro bono lawyers that had been talking to these men. And she talked to another man who gave an almost identical uh, scenario, and he was incarcerated at a separate facility in Conroe, Texas, which is not far from Livingston. So presuming if you sign a deportation order, your deportation will be accelerated. If you have a child who's in a facility in another state or far away, I mean, what are the challenges when it comes to reuniting these parents with their children? Well, so when I, when I found out about this story, the immigration attorneys were assuming that things would happen the way they've always happened, which is, you know, when, when children are in facility, you know, that, that it would take a long time for, for the kids to be processed and all that, and that it was logistically impossible for this to happen. But um, I thought when we got this story that there was, this was really an outlier situation. But now we've seen other reports, this fact sheet that came out of DHS that said that you know, uh, that people could be deported and, it, 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 you know, would be deported and they, they could be reunited with their children. They're calling the uh, Port Isabel uh, down in South Texas a family reunification and removal center. So these things are going in tandem. So uh, we don't really know how this is, this, this has never happened before. We've never had this level of child separation this many people like this happened before. So whether or not this is actually possible that people can uh, get their kids back on the way out of the U.S. If they, if they sign a deportation order, we really don't even know. And so, Jay, what happens to children if their parents are deported without them? Well, they're stuck here. Um, and to try to get that, you know, if, if they have a relative here, um, you know, hopefully, they'll get to go with that relative. Um, the, the case that I wrote, uh, wrote about Carlos has a sister um, in Southern California, and um, his, so he's in Livingston, Texas, the, Carlos is. His daughter is in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and the aunt is in the LA area. And so if he goes back and his daughter doesn't go with him, you know, he's hoping at least the, the aunt, his sister, can take care of this child, this six-year-old child who's suffering from asthma, by the way, and who's been sick. And I talked to the mother last night. So the mother of Carlos and his wife both are in Honduras. And um, I talk, I've talked to both of them now. I talked to the wife last night for about 10 minutes, and she told me that she's been having a hard time get a, getting a hold of her. So what people are being told is that, oh, just call this 1-800 number or call some number and we'll get you set up. Well, 
the, the mother of this six-year-old child, Carlos's wife, told me that she has tried to call and has the birth certificates and said, I can prove that I'm the mother, but they won't let her call. Only the daughter can call when a certain caregiver is there to get in touch with her. So what people are being told will happen is not actually happen, happening when you talk to the parents or the, or the caregivers or the, the lawyers for these people. So Jay, how long was Car has Carlos been detained? So he crossed uh, the border uh, near McAllen, Texas on May 25th. On May 29th, his daughter was taken away with him after, at, at right around the same time he was pleading guilty to illegal entry. Um, he spoke, then he was incarcerated. At some point, he was moved from McAllen to Livingston, Texas. So he's been, he's been basically detained ever since he crossed the border and turned himself in on May 25th. You know, we've been um, he hearing about sort of this asylum process that it takes months and months and months before they can make a determination. So I'm kind of surprised that they were able to determine that Carlos's case was not valid so quickly. It hasn't been that long. Um, well, go ahead. That, here, here's the thing, though, is that uh, the credible fear exam is the first step, mm. and, and you can appeal that. But I mean, you know, he was, the way he described it to me was that he was desperate because he talked to his daughter one time and she said, please get me out of here. She begged him to get her out of there. And um, he was distraught. And so he lost his credible fear exam. But, but a lot of times these credible, that, that's just the first step. And so if you have an attorney, an attorney can take that before an immigration judge. And there's a study out um, that I read yesterday, I believe from the California, uh, a California-based uh, university law review um, that says that about half of the case of the credible fear failures end up getting reversed. And so um, now what he wants to do, based on the advice of attorneys who sort of shuffle through, I mean, he doesn't have an attorney in, in, the, in the traditional context because basically these people go in and see him and it's hard to get in to see him. Um, and uh, they basically are trying to instruct him, trying to tell him, fight this don't do you know try to undo what you signed and we'll represent you and try to get you out of this mm. and, and and go fight your credible fear uh uh decision and and move forward with your asylum claim and that's what his family wants him to do they're absolutely terrified that he'll be killed if he goes back to honduras uh so jay what was ice's response to the questions that you raised in your story about these detainees who are signing these deportation agreements so ice wanted me to give uh Carlos's real name, Carlos is not his real name, um, and his alien registration number. I, I declined to do that. And the reason is, is that if once I give that information to the government, then I don't know what they're going to do with it. And I just felt like I had to respect the deal that I made with him was don't reveal my name. And keep in mind that there is incredible secrecy over these detentions. When you get arrested, if I walked out of here and got arrested, you would know my name, mm -hmm. you would know my uh, identifying information, but these people like go into detention and then they disappear. And so I, I just, I didn't feel comfortable with that. They felt like it was unfair for me to write about this if I didn't give that information, but I just, I, I can't betray the confidence that this person, that I made with this person, this deal that I made with him. Well, I just can't imagine as a parent, I mean, talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Your child is begging you to, to come get her, and you get this piece of paper in front of you that says you can get her as soon as you sign this. Mm. Can you blame people? Uh, Jay Root, thank you so much. Thank you.